everybody, and welcome to Rocket Lasso Live, Season 3, Episode 3. We've got people hanging out in the chat already on Twitch and on YouTube. Everybody is saying where they're from. Everything is good. I've got some little bits of news. First of all, based on a question from two weeks ago for the vacuum forming, I have recorded a tutorial. And if you're supporting a Patreon, I've posted it on Patreon already. It'll go public in about a week. And this is the end result of that. Very fun. I really, I mean, there's a lot about this setup I like. I put it on YouTube because I can use the YouTube controls to really easily be able to change it. But we took a lot of what we did in the original live stream a couple weeks ago and made it a lot fancier. So the ability to, I guess I can't scrub it very well, but the ability for it to deform, take on the shape, and then put the suction on and add extra detail. A lot of fun and specific things we can do with that. I hope it's really busy. Once the live streams all begin, it becomes really difficult for me to do extra things, but I would really love to get a couple of different renders going where I put different models in so I can at least post, post those on social media before the tutorial goes out and fully public. But I like that. And as I said, if you're on Patreon, the tutorial is already fully posted and you can go check that out and actually if you're supporting at the engineer level the i've even got the scene files posted for that if you like reverse engineering you should go check that out if you haven't gotten a chance um, for anybody who is already on patreon or just wants to see it here's a link in the chat to the tutorial already being posted boop, boop. and that will be in the notes below this video as well and then what's up next well um, this goes for everybody watching the video live and for everybody watching the video. There is actually a Rocket Lasso newsletter. It's a Rocket Lasso Roundup. And I have not been kind of pushing it that much, but I'd really love if people start joining the newsletter. I do not put it out very often, but every time that there is big news from Rocket Lasso, I'm going to post it. Let me grab the proper link for that. Where did Firefox go? There's Firefox. That's not the right window. That's the right window. Haha. -ha. There's the link. So here is a link to the newsletter. And here's the important thing. I do not spam the newsletter. In fact, since the company is over two years old now, and I've only put out two newsletters. So it's very infrequent. It's only when there's significant news. So definitely go and check out the newsletter. Um, just to get important news for like when a new season is beginning or a new tool is launching or maybe a special sale is happening. In any case, the last bit of news is, um, yeah, this is, they said that this was fixed and that maybe there's just like a caching issue, but I'm going to take a screenshot of this so I can say it's still not quite working in we're Slack. Ha ha. Post. Um, anyway, the other little bit of news is I started putting together a schedule. I have to format this a little bit better. The, um, the interface was a little bit weird, but there's a schedule for the upcoming streams and some guests that are coming up. So the official guests right now, we got Jin <clears throat> Jonathan Windbrush on the 10th of March and then Nick Campbell on March 24th and, uh, Nick Denbauer, uh, Smearballs on April 7th. And there's actually more guests lined up. I didn't want to make the list too long. So you can go to the Rocket Lasso live stream page and see a list of the upcoming guests as well as links to their work. So oh, hopefully that's not playing with audio. Oh, yeah, I turned off the audio, so it should be fine. Anyway, there's that additional bit of news. Now I think we are ready to start tackling some questions. Actually, uh, here's a scene file that I, uh, I'm working on right now where... Um, I'm trying to make a countdown animation for the live stream where it'll give like a two minute warning before I go live so you can actually see a countdown. But I thought it'd be fun to make a, an animation. So I'm trying to set it up so that the uh, text like does this transition. But I, it was really silly. I've been working on this this morning. But for the countdown, instead of just making a couple of keyframes, I built an Espresso rig to automatically properly do the countdown in the format that I want it to. So a bunch of ridiculous extra detail, but that's what I do. If I didn't go ridiculous, I wouldn't learn all these new things and I couldn't share it with other people. Uh, okay, so scrolling around in the chat, let's see what we've got going on. There's my links. Uh, as I've mentioned, if I don't get to your question, feel free to post it again a little bit later. Just don't spam it. And uh, we've got a question from Mick. I always try and click on questions from new people or from 
names I don't recognize. Let me mute the tab and then pull it over. Okay, so the question is, how would you go about creating this bubble wavy thing? Is this what I think it is? Oh no. Well, somebody's scene file. Actually, it's really interesting because that really that looks really similar to something we made. Um, that looks really similar to something we made. Now, actually, it's not related because you can see right there that they're using a bunch of X particles things, I think. Um, but uh, that wavy looking thing is pretty cool. This is from Wing uh, from Will McNeil during uh, one of the Maxon shows, the 3D motion design show. Um, so we can try and tackle this in a completely different way and see if we can make anything cool. And there's a couple of different layers I can think. Actually, back at GSG, when our maybe 21 first came out with fields, I made an entire presentation for making waves. And that is what this is making me think of. And let's see if we can do a little bit of that type of thing. So here we are in our 23. We need a plane with a significant amount of subdivisions. 55 should run pretty quickly and give us enough resolution to see what we're doing here. Leave everything else default. Um, right out of the gate, I imagine a vertex map is going to be the way to go here. So adding in a vertex map out of point mode, which is an easy way to make one, but going to point mode, now we can click on set vertex weight. This pops open, creates the tag at zero. Turn that on, say use fields. Now we can control this however we want. Freeze, we will probably be using some growth, but let's not even worry about that yet. To begin with, uh, we want to create some sort of splash. Um, and uh, yeah, we're not trying to exactly emulate what we saw in the other video. So let's start out with a ball. And we could feed this sphere in directly and use it as a source. You can make it calculate a lot quicker if we create a spherical field and th just make that a child of our sphere. It's just going to calculate very mathematically accurately. So by creating that and setting the radius to be pretty much exactly matching the sphere, it give, gives us the same effect, but we don't need to, uh, it won't have to be calculating the volume of the sphere, which can take a little while. Now, let's just make a simple splash. Create a keyframe on Y. Mm, 25 frames later, pull this below the ground. So temporarily visually hide the sphere. And we can see that this is going to just bunk. You can immediately see that little spot up here. Now we could make the spot remain. This is one of the easy things is create a decay. And now as the sphere passes quickly through it, you see it actually slowly fades away. And the stronger we make the Mac, the effect strength, the longer it will take to fade away. So that's one thing we can do. Um, I would like to start visual. Well, actually, it's kind of nice to keep it just in this vertex map world right now as a way of visualizing it. So that creates the initial splash and then we have a decay so it fades away. Combining some of these things, I know how to do it, but well, I've done it before, but there's always more to tinker with and more to learn. So we might have to tinker for a little bit. But my thought is if you're gonna do some sort of splashing, you probably want some sort of some sort of growth. So let's say grow. A very important variable here is what is the distance between these points. So I'll select two and we can see that they are 7.27 apart. So we can round that. I mean, honestly, 10 is fine. That will catch it in the range. So it's currently seeing a radius of 10, which is enough to jump to the next spot and affect strength of 100. So my thought right now is if we hit play, it's gonna grow really quickly or not. Um, freeze needs to be set to add. And I think that's fine. Now we hit play there. And now you see it hits and the growth begins happening right away. It grows out really strong until it covers everything. We don't want that. Let's have it slow down a bit. So effect strength can be 10%. Now it's gonna add 10% every frame. So it will take 10 frames to grow that same speed. You see everything becomes a lot softer, but you will see that we're kind of getting this 45 degree square happening. And that's just by the nature of the way we're telling this to grow. The radius is so small and tight that they can only grow to the next one. So it's essentially that same shape repeating outward for for forever. A way we can get around that is increasing the radius to something larger, which will speed it up, but then we can slow it down by lowering the effect strength. And by increasing that radius, you can see this is getting more round. So the larger we make this and the weaker the power, then we can essentially get this to start slowly 
growing out in a rounder way is just what I'm getting at there. Now, we don't need it to be too slow. In fact, you know, you could argue we want this to be a lot quicker than it currently is. But, well, let's see what, here's where I'm a little fuzzy on what we might need to do because here this effect is growing outward, which is good. It's fine, but we essentially want that to fade away. And I'm trying to remember how I did that because how do I do that because we could just subtract overall but it's currently growing so I don't think that would work here's my thought is if we made I don't think this will work but if we take a solid and we set that to I don't know 20 percent and I say okay you are something of strength 20 percent I would like you to start subtracting your amount of power from everything then actually it does fade that away so let's see if we if we make it less than the growth yeah that's less than the growth was constantly erasing everything out if we tell this to look at subfields only what does that do well it's not even seeing the top one then yeah the combinations here are going to get really specific i have to kind of watch my own video again to remember exactly what i did there but that's not to say we don't have things we could do here because here here's one i can actually remember one thing right away if we make a Let's not worry about the decay. If I make, yeah, yeah, I think I do remember. If I make a delay, then this is a way of either making it spring, but I would like to make it smooth it out. So let me show you what's happening. Currently, this is looking at everything below it, and it's just going to smooth out the effect, which probably just means it's slowing it down a lot. This growth is still happening, but it's making it smooth out. You'll see if it sets to zero, the growth happens very quickly. If I put a little bit of speed on it, little power it's going to slow that down as it moves outward and this is sort of overriding all the results underneath it however if i say this is that result i would like you to subtract from what's below let's see what happens okay that sort of worked but it happened really quickly do you see how we get that little burst there's kind of like a little wrinkle right there so that's interesting I would like to, let's try, I'm going to keep on increasing the effect strength and see if we can slow it down. Yes, um, let's unclamp it, see if that does anything. Hmm. Well, that's creating an echo. Add, subtract, subfields only. Maybe we don't subtract everything. Hmm, I thought I had this a little bit. Uh, uh, Badger, there is a YouTube feed. I just forgot to make it public. So there is a link to YouTube, but I forgot to set it as public. And once I hit go, then I can't change it or it changes the URL. So that's my own fault, but I just have to remember. Um, so that's a delay on subtract. Uh, I see that Paul independently suggested a delay on subtract. Um, it's not spring mode. The We have to subtract the delay. It should be the overall effect. It should only see what's coming underneath it. I'm not quite sure what the problem is here because it should be seeing kind of an echo. Oh, wait, the growth isn't happening. What? Oh, hang on, I must have changed something. Is that the subfield only broke that? Okay, the subfields only broke that, so let's keep that in mind. Um, so I'll turn this back on. Now we get that. Well, now we got this oscillation. If we turn that up all the way, that is not quite working. Mm, I'd have to wrap my head around it. Is that because of a clamp? That could Clamping is really important on this type of scenario. Mm, I thought that would work. There is a way to do this. It's not immediately coming to me. But this should have the exact same amount of power that's below it. And then erase it out. Maybe maybe I have to make a, a feed one into the other so that one can be established so it's not creating a loop on that. Let's try. Let's see what happens if that's the case. Otherwise, uh, it'll be one I would like to do a little bit of research on and then get back to you when it's not during a stream. So let's see if we get this to work. So there's been what I would typically want to call a bug happening, which is the vertex maps override each other. However, if we call this map one, 
and then give the other one a different name, there's a chance it will work. Map two. So those are now two different vertex maps. And the problem usually comes in if we try and feed one ver vertex map into the other, which is a very important workflow. Now let's see if this does transfer over. And it did seem to transfer over. And the first one is hopefully still working. So that's all fine. So if that map is getting transferred over, can we now add the delay on top of it and then subtract here? Okay, yeah, there we go. This is this is what we were missing. Do you see how I am now getting what looks like a shock wave traveling to the outside? That's essentially what we've been going for. So now we've got a couple of tools to tinker with and let's figure out what we need. So that's our freeze, that's our growth. Um, by the very nature of it, I want it to travel quicker. So I'll increase those strengths. This gets transferred over. And we see that one, it, it's getting transferred over, but it's erasing it out very quickly. The smoothing might need a larger, if we have a larger effect, I guess it's where the two overlap, so it does make sense. Um, so we might need to crank up the power again using a curve. Let's go to a point that we can see the arc and then pull this. Oh, it's triggering a refresh, so we have to do it live. I would like this to map brighter. So that should brighten up our shock wave. We so now yeah, we've got an automatic shock wave happening. I keyframed this plane originally. I am going to make it move up and down. Oh. Ba, 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 ba. This is not my original splashing setup because um this is not the original splashing setup because I know I could splash into it multiple times, but this original map is full power. And we can't have this be full power because I can't splash into it multiple times if we have full power. I, I'm just gonna have to go and research this field method more and I honestly just watch my own video again because I'm just blanking on the very particular combination it needs. But I had said that I have two different ideas of how to do this effect. So let me show you the second one because this one just needs a little more time to research. So I can still do the next step I was going to do. And that is, I guess we could do it with a deformation or we could do it with a fall off. I guess I'll do it. Let's try it with a collider body. That could be interesting. I mean, you know, in the new tutorial, we play with the collider body. So I would like a little bit of automatic random animation here. So enable position. I would like this to be traveling around 222, 222 and 555. Set this to 0.5. It's probably still going to be too quick, but let's see what we get. Eh, it's not terrible. So it's moving up and down. Scale it down a little bit. And... Um, not the most rapid one, but let's uh, let's see what we get. Uh, I don't think this needs to be parametric. or It doesn't need to be editable anymore, so I'll make a new plane. 55, 55... Jump it up to about a thousand, give us a better range, and create the collider, core collision deformer that goes inside the plane. The collision is looking for the sphere, and let's just start out with that. So that's going to go as boop, boop, and you can see it's just creating that little, that little pressure pushing down, and it pops very, very quickly. There's a lot of settings that I'm not an expert in. One big one is size. If we increase the size, it'll see that better. We could also increase the steps, and that's going to make both of those things more accurate. You see that those are at least reacting. And then other things like our stiffness, that can get lowered. Uh, let's see if we lower all of these. If we get No, we're not really getting much in the way of a reaction. Uh, I would like that to slow down a bit. So we've got restore shape. I'll lower that to 10%. So now you can see it's going to take a little while to fade back into its position. And it's actually, it's doing a better job overall. So you can see it actually will push up, it'll push down, which is giving us some decent reaction as far as an upward movement and a downward movement. I don't know in advance if, if there are settings that we can actually make that wobbly, like right out of the gate. You see this is just smoothly transitioning from one to the other. And I just don't have a good intuition for these settings. A lot of them are very subtle, like changing this to a one didn't change anything. Stretch, who knows, stiffness, uh, flexion. A lot of these are like its desire to get back to its original shape. So I think a little bit of all of them, it's fine. 
But the you, most of you probably know where I'm going with this already, and that is creating the jiggle deformer. This can now process after this first one, and this can start adding on additional motion on top of it. So let's say almost no drag, and I'm gonna pull way back on the structural, and the stiffness is gonna be one of the big ones. So now the collision deformer is what gives us the initial collision, and then all of these ripples happen just because of the jiggle. So look with very little effort, just two deformers, we are now getting an entirely parametric little water reactive splash rig that even pushes up and pushes down depending on the orientation of the sphere coming in. Um, just to give us some more to see, I'll create a second sphere. Give that a different seed so we can at least have two. I think so. There should be two spheres now. Yeah, just zero that out. And we'll create a material in there. Yeah, so splash, splash. Um, so you see that how quick it is to put this rig together. And we do have a lot of ability to manipulate this even further. Um, the jiggle, obviously, we can lower the stiffness and the structural even more. And everything is going to become even... Yeah, it, it's good. The ripples will travel out further. They'll be sharper. Let's try increasing our resolution. And everything slows down, but you can definitely get a little bit more of a ripple thing going. But now it's traveling through more polygons, so the jiggle would probably have to compensate with even smaller numbers. Splash, splash, splash. Um, and yeah, actually, you never know. Structural being big might actually make it travel out further. Look at those big splashes. Yeah, so those and it's just really nice basic ripples on there. The strength can always go above 100%, which is funny, but we can set that up to 200%. And now we can get like crazy reactions from this. If we, it's actually pretty good for these like ripples traveling out from it. It's not so good for that initial splash, but we could make it that the original collision is reacting a lot less. And then those would be less inclined to go crazy. Drop the size down. That should automatically calm those down a bit. So lots of fun combinations there. I don't have any super specific recipes. I would just open it up and begin playing with it to uh, get the look I'm going for. The uh, I probably also wouldn't be shy about putting a smoothing deformer afterward. I'll just you gotta be careful because the more iteration we put, the more it's going to smooth it. But I'll take the edge off a lot of this. It's kind of a smoothing out effect. And I, and I don't know, uh, there's a chance if we put a like jiggle after the jiggle, it's going to double process that. But I wouldn't be surprised if we start getting uh, like ripples that travel out further if we were to do something like that. Um, yeah, jiggle, jiggle, and then this. Put the smooth in between. Actually, let's try putting a bunch of iterations of smoothing so that I can't go too crazy. And then make the second jiggle go way more. Let's just see what that does. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, so you can see this can get super crazy, and you get uh, it looks it starts looking pretty cool, and it is not a complicated setup. The collision deformer does a pretty good job. Keep in mind that we could make these be any shape or any size. If one of these spheres were to get way larger, it should do a bigger initial splash. Burp. I'm pushing. Yeah, you know, obviously we cranked a bunch of these things up, so it's going super crazy. But let's just simplify it run quicker, so we can get bigger splash because of a bigger object. Um, as I said, this is with a sphere just going with the collision deformer. We could also have done it instead of the collision deformer. We could have used like a plane deformer and use a spherical fall off or the object. And as it hits, it would deform it up or down. And that could make it definitively go up or down. And that would also potentially prevent, prevent this from like overshooting really, really far up or really far down. It could just be traveling up or down and it wouldn't be getting the sideways motion. Although sideways motion is probably a little bit more realistic. That splash going up, it looks bad because it starts intersecting. But keep in mind that this, it'll slow us down a lot. But this entire thing could, let's get, I want to get a frame where it's kind of exploding weirdly. It's all right, but I think this will give us one. So even this, you see this big lump that's happening there? Potentially, I mean, first of all, you could, a smoothing deformer will knock that back quite a bit oh, the jiggle jiggle overrides everything but around frame 75 we can see that I just want to see if the smoothing um, calms that initial thing down a lot yeah you see see that smoothing is now stopped out from shooting out almost at all um, 
but you can get these weird um, like lumps that can overlap itself and that could look weird for a wrinkle but of course this entire thing can be fed into a volume builder volume mesher and now it is creating a mesh over it of course it's an infinitely thin mesh the volume builder is currently set to 10 so we want this to have a thickness we can give it a thickness by saying dilate put a dilate and as long as we set that to five it means it's getting five thicker above and five thicker below which meets our minimum threshold of 10 so now even a plane will have a little bit of thickness it's not running terribly so now i mean increasing the resolution overall would be a good idea but now you should be able to see that even if we were to get that funky lump happening it will just it's even hard to see here but it'll just pass over itself and you'll get like these nice cavities and you just get that final overall shape because of the fast to calculate but low resolution i could make a copy of the smoothing deformer here and you can see here that it goes from these somewhat sharp edges and just start increasing the strength of that and boom, nice and smooth. Maybe a few more iterations to get it absolutely smooth, but now we get that nice clean surface of the water look and you know, even making a reflective material trivial here. So no color and remove, add, GGX. There we get our nice shiny water effect. Reflection strength can be full, or, uh, roughness down to zero. And now we can at least get something a little bit reflective. Splash. So yeah, getting basic water ripples, not terribly difficult if you just use a couple of deformers. I will look into getting my uh, fields version of this working better, but that, uh, that should be that. Save the scene file. This goes into episode three. Scene files. That will be mm, collision jiggle. Uh, we'll say water. So yeah, that is that. Uh, we got more people showing up. Welcome everybody. Apologies again for not getting the YouTube link correct. New file. We got more questions coming in on Twitch. I see Tyrone posted a link. Yeah, I definitely want to figure out the vertex map one, Mick. So that is a thing I want to do. Tyrone's got a question here about a glass texture change. So I'll try taking a look at that. And then uh, Jared had a question, a very basic question. How do you align distribute objects like you can do easily in After Effects? If you have two nulls spaced apart and I want to distribute a few objects equally between them. Uh, well, I don't know how they work specifically in After Effects. If I wanted to evenly space things out, um, let me, I'm gonna tackle this real quick and then go back to Tyrone's question because I think that might be a little bit longer. So let's just look at some of the basic distribution in cinema. It's not a tool I use very often, but let's just I'm gonna create uh, five different spheres. And let's see, is this even a thing? I, I, I could be crazy and this isn't a thing at all. That goes there, there, and just moving those around randomly. So selecting all those, mm, let's see, tools, arrange, and here's an arrange tool. So we could arrange along a spline, make them arrange linear. So if we set to linear, we could say, uh, what is this going to do? Hit apply. Okay, by hitting apply, it has lined all these objects up 50 apart. So that's one thing it could do. It's per step, hit apply, enable. And is this even, so I could, okay, so how would we do this? I want, X, Y, Z, that's aligning them along Y. What if I just wanted them all in the same spot? I'm gonna try turning those off and hit apply. Okay, so that has arranged them probably in the order of operations along Y. So if I say zero and hit new transform, there we go, okay. So if we turn off X and Y and we say, I want them to be spaced out zero on Y, you can see I've now spaced them out on Y. So they've all gotten zeroed out there, or we could say, so that's one thing. This is not a tool I'm used to. I just knew it existed. You can set them in a circle. I mean, that's just automatically placed in the circle. 
typically I don't I wouldn't even I don't think of it this way. I don't have the objects already existing. I would probably just feed things into a cloner to tell you the truth if I had um like between two nulls, I'm not even sure what you mean. But let's say I have a sphere or I might know what you mean, but I'm trying to think of the use case. So I have uh, a couple more shapes. We'll do that. And uh and the pyramid. Okay, so there's five different objects. And if I wanted them all arranged in some way, I would just put them into a cloner and I'd use this cloner to do it however I want. So if I wanted them centered in a line, I could just say, hey, I want five across one by one. And that's going to create exactly five. And that is the spacing. So that is exactly a spacing. As soon as I make it editable, then it's going to make those the real ones now. So those have now been arranged. Then if I wanted to, I don't know if I can... Well, okay, if you wanted to distribute these along a point, it's a couple steps, I suppose. But if I if I make a null, yeah, this is this won't be bad. So turning off this cloner, we've got a big pile of objects. They could all be everywhere and anywhere. Doesn't matter how they're arranged. So here's null one, there is null two, and null one is here, and null two is here. We want to distribute between those somehow. And let's even make it weirder. I'll move one up into the air. So there's no way in a cloner to directly line them up in between. But I could select both nulls, create a tracer, which will automatically make them children, connect all objects. Nope. Connect elements. Nope. Uh, don't trace vertices. Come on, tracer. Trace subgroups, tra connect objects. Oh, I, it didn't refresh, but it is there. By creating the tracer, setting it to connect all objects, then those two nulls have a spline drawn between them. It's a straight linear line. So now this cloner, well, you know, you have your objects randomly. Make a new cloner. Drop them all as a child of the cloner. Turn on the cloner. This will be set to object mode. The object will be the tracer. And if we set the count to five, which is the number of objects we know we have, we now have those five objects. Here's an important, important detail. And that is, yeah, that, that the refresh issue might have been that the tracer was above them. The tracer is, spline stuff is very specific about the order of operations. So that could be a thing. But anyway, you can see that these are all lined up, but there's sort of the space, enough space for another object here. That is, it's good that it does that in cinema. That's set up so that you can do this offset where they'll travel along and then travel to the other side. If you wanted this to perfectly space them out between, then uh, just turn off loop. And now they'll stretch all the way from the very start point to the very end point, and everything is evenly distributed there. The order is set to iterate. So first object, second object, third. You could rearrange them very simply that way. If you wanted there to be a space on the edges, obviously really easy to take your start and end and offset them if you want to be specific that way. But if you wanted even spacing, you could always put blank things in there, like a null, to be like, okay, I want there to be an empty space, empty space. So we'll start out with a null. We'll end with a null increase this by two objects and now you know there's exactly an objects width there and this is live so i should be able to take these nulls and move them around and all of that will be distributed but directly between them that is the way i would that my brain would go to because you can just create this line i mean i created two nulls and it's nice to be able to interlink them in that way keep in mind you just need a spline so we could have potentially simplified that by creating a single line so an end side set to two sides or you know, set down to two, make it editable. This is now just literally a line with, I guess it's got three points. Wait a second. I thought, oh wait, did I, what did I mean? Yeah, wait, if I drop that down to two, it's supposed to turn into a 2D line. Is it not anymore? Did they change that? Oh, oh no, that's just a null. Okay, it's still working. Um, anyway, uh, this is now the line, and we could just move these individual points if we wanted to. So by dragging in this end side, it's the same idea, but instead of there being two nulls, we just made a spline, and those can just get moved around and space. So yeah, that's how I would go about distributing objects. A couple steps, but the point here being is we've kind of made a little mini rig. And we could do anything we want with that rig for how the things are getting spaced out. We could do duplications of them. So by doubling this amount, so we have 17, we'll jump it up to 14. There's now double the object. So null, blah, 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 all the way through. Null, starting over again, null. So And then you could randomize them. So by building a little rig, I think it gives us a lot of power to make it do exactly what we want it to do. 
Um, you could all, you could probably also set up a little bit of Espresso to make it automatically change this count to perfectly match the number of objects you have inside and things like that. So yeah, that's a that's a little something. That'll be two a arranging objects rig. Hopefully that answers your question. Yep, seems like it did. Okay, back to the glass texture question. Let's see what we've got here. Pop that open. Mute the tab just in case there is audio. This is from David McLeod. Mc, no, McLeod. Mc, McLeod. McLeod? Maybe McLeod. David McLeod. Piece six out of six. Uh, it's another one of those crypto art things. Man, you cannot go on social media these days without a barrage of crypto stuff. Um, ignoring that, let's see what we're looking at here. Uh, this is the transition between something that looks transparent and something that's not. Now, they're using Octane. I don't have Octane. Can we limit things to, I mean, this just goes to, well, I guess it wouldn't, oh no, it could be a vertex map. We could do a vertex map. Let's just do the simple version to start out with. And we can try it in cinema and we can try it in Redshift if we're so inclined to begin with. We'll just subdivide this thing a bit, make it editable, create a vertex map, control it with fields, and just as a, we can do the very basic version of this very, very quickly by creating a spherical fall off, pull the spherical fall off to the side, and I want no transition, so I'll crank that up all the way. So you can see that we've got a little window in there, apply a material to it, and let's give it some sort of color and under transparency i think almost everything that we're doing is under transparency first under reflectance remove add ggx no blur no specular so now we got a shiny something or other and then under transparency this is where i would like to feed in the vertex map so you feed a vertex map. The vertex map can be dragged in. And now we should get a vertex map. It's going to be a little hard to see visually, but let's see if I render. Um, I guess we'll need some lighting. Keep it simple. Shadow, that should give us hopefully a little bit of definition. Hmm. I guess maybe something to reflect is a good idea. Uh, I've got just a random HDR from HDRA Haven, someplace I know where to grab it. So this is an HDRA Haven. In fact, it was the last thing I'd loaded like this. So you can go to HDRA Haven and get those free HDRs, which are pretty cool. Let's see if that actually shows up something now. Uh, I guess the entire thing is being made shiny, which is making it a little difficult to see. So how about taking that same vertex map and throwing it into the color channel? Oh wait, no, into the reflection under reflection strength. That's where I'd like the vertex map to be. So if I did that right, why is a uh, why are we getting no color? There's only a little bit of color in the edge. Turn off transparency. Reflection. What the color channel. So the reflectance is completely overriding it. I just said the reflection strength should be down, but I guess this is, I guess if we set that to add. No. Additive. Okay, now it's finally coming through. If that was set to additive, I suppose that maybe we don't want this under the reflection strength and we don't want that probably don't want that under additive instead of that being under reflection strength. We'll copy that 
and put it under the mask. There we go. That's finally doing what I expected. So now that we simplified, I can go to transparency and now that becomes transparent and we can look inside of it. But you see, I just masked off that vertex map with a really strong the reflection stops going. We want the reflection on there, don't we? I guess it just needs a Fresnel. Maybe I'm being silly. Maybe I'm being silly because it's completely reflective. So without a Fresnel, yeah, I was, I was skipping a step in my head. There we go. That should be fine. Now it looks shiny and that's going through. And even when it becomes transparent, there's no mask anywhere anymore. Um, as it becomes transparent, the reflections can still transition to the other side. And the Fresnel is creating that stuff in the background. Uh, the the reflection is only in some spots so we can actually see three see through to the blue now in the transparency we still get this little bit of a transition you could feed this into anything like a colorizer i'm going to put into a filter and the filter actually gives you a nice um, remapping here of like rgb values and you can also just crank the contrast honestly so let's see there should be eh, i guess it's still showing a little bit of one let's try remapping them so let's see if that actually will give us no transition between the two. Yeah, you see I sharpened I sharpened that up so that vertex map always naturally has a little bit of fall off. But by cranking the contrast up with something like this, we could have done it with clipping as well. Um, you can see that that transition has gone away. Of course, this is now going to be dependent on the resolution of your polygons to do the shape. If we look back at the reference... I'm curious, because you could just heavily subdivide something. Um, um, yeah. I suppose um, this, if I want to avoid this, a simpler way of doing this would be killing off the vertex map entirely and we could drive this with a proximal that would get rid of the lines uh, I'll still use a spherical field just as the axis of this and start distance 99% so let's see yeah so now you see I've done the exact same thing instead of using a vertex map I'm using a um, a proximal and that does the a similar effect. We could probably make this stand out even more if we were to say take a luminance and inside of there I'll say I would like a normal direction please and now the outside is getting full power so I'm gonna say I want the outside to have none and we'll say the inside is glowing green so now this inside is illuminated green let's pull back on we want full power there and multiply by this. Now I can lower that so we can get a little bit of a green glow going on the inside. So that could be doing its own thing. You can also have your own internal illumination inside of it, I suppose. Now, another thing that ends up happening is if you look at this, I guess, yeah, that is behaving like this where there is a full shape. One of the, they have something you can see inside of it. So if we were to make a cube, so there's something we actually see inside of this thing. You can actually start to make that happen. That's glass. We could lower it. That's obviously something abstract, so I can lower it and it's not going to be as intense. That could live inside there. And now we get the transparency where we want it to. And... Yeah, I feel like it might look nice if there's some sort of grounding inside of it. So perhaps um, ambient occlusion. Let's see. Uh, evaluate transparency, please. How large is this? I thought that would... I guess it's not that close to the ground. The refraction is deceptive. Yeah, especially... Yeah, now you can see there's a little bit of grounding in there. If I were to take the spherical field and move it then that will change where the window is. So those could be independent blobs traveling around to reveal or unreveal different things inside of the object. And then, yeah, if this was now a soft body, it could be bouncing and blobbing around and you could have shapes inside, shapes outside. Um, pretty straightforward of a rig once you get some of that going. 
the um, as a let me think how do I want to do this the proximal setup is all fine mm, how about we make yeah I got an idea I'd like to make this a little a little more abstract perhaps let's make a cube make it larger 500 by 500 by 200 so I want to control the sphere I don't need them to be very high poly so all that can get hidden this we'll deal this step by step should we just start a scene file over maybe I'm gonna start again from scratch so we can make something a little better create a cube and we'll set that to 500 by 500 and now it's 200 on Z that I would like to have a render display use line so we can see through the box that can now be fed a sphere which I'll set to icosahedron so we get these nice blobby polygons then we'll create a couple of blobs in the scene pretty straightforward to throw that into a cloner three by z will be one so those all line up like that t for scale scale them down overall so they fit nicely inside then i would like to randomize them quite a bit i wonder actually yeah we can animate them randomize that's a good idea does that work with a soft body i think it does so here's the thought those all become soft bodies this cube becomes a rigid body Actually, I should have said collider, but I'll just say it is not dynamic. So those should be inside. Make sure that this is a static mesh. So those should be able to fall and be blobby inside of it. No gravity, please. General gravity turned off. Now we want these drifting around. I th I'm just going to do a turbulence because that I don't plan on going any further than that. We could, but a turbulence, I usually set turbulence to 55. It gives you a definitive amount of movement so those start moving around now this cloner could be fed a mm. what do i want i want some random let's get some random going i would like them to have a random noise this should be affecting not position but i would like to affect the scale we'll do it in a uniform way i'm not even sure if this will work but i think it will yeah, so those can be scaling up and down. There's an animation speed and a scale. I would like the scale to be quite large. And the animation speed can be quite low because as they travel around, they will be starting to pass through it anyway. So we'll just have to figure out what a good size is. Uh, let's have them be out, uh, absolute scale so they're always getting larger. Now we don't want them intersecting in the beginning, so I will keyframe this up in the beginning. So the strength at zero will be zero and the strength at 10 will be 100. Hit play. And now that will actually be able to grow up so they can actually start colliding into each other. Um, they seem to be scaling in a very uniform way. So the scale might be too large, set to 200 and they should become a little bit more individual. There's still some animation speed, so it will be changing overall. I would like this to be going even larger, so they actually are gonna get squished and bounced around a bunch, a bunch there. Um, we could make additional ones so they could really be squishing. You see, it's, everything's running quite quickly still. So we have, uh, we have options. Um, I guess if they were going larger and smaller, that could be a thing. But let's keep it somewhat simple right now. Set that to three. This will be file number three. You get access to these scene files on Patreon. Um, let's see. Hmm. Blobby, good old blobs. I love blobs. Blobby, blobby window. That'll work. Now, in order to add a little extra something here, how about creating a cube, shrinking the cube, and I'm gonna put the cube as a child of the sphere, so it's doing everything it is, but I'm also gonna make it a soft body. Um, we could make it a very rigid soft body. I mean, we could probably make it a rigid body, honestly. Let's try making it a rigid body. 
rigging rigid body. Now, just temporarily, I would like to see just the cubes and we'll see what they're doing. Make, so they, they will scale with the same thing, which we could avoid. I'm not, that's not a problem for me right now. But yeah, so the, you see, we actually have cubes trapped inside of them. So they'll kind of travel around and do the same thing. Something I think would be kind of neat if we give those cubes a little bit of gravity, just them. So simulate forces, I suppose we could just do gravity. I almost never do, but now there's gravity. This will affect everything. So I need to make sure to tell this one forces include turbulence. So it's going to see the turbulence, but it's not going to see the gravity. So now those should see the turbulence and the gravity. So that means the cube should always be hanging out near the bottom. That will give overall force for everything wanting to pull down. But those will now do their thing and be trapped inside. We could, of course, make more cubes inside of it. That should be, they're pretty low. Those will be pretty low maintenance overall. Uh, I'm trying to think of an easy way of doing it. I guess we could just make a second cube like that. Now there will be two cubes inside. Now they are, yeah, they're children of that. So they will be independently getting cloned. We could make the cubes be affected or not affected by putting them in a separate cloner that just happens to have the same distribution. But now we've done this part of it. Now, um, what is my thought for doing this window? It can be fed, and let's try doing it in Redshift because why not? It's not something I usually do. Um, make sure that this box that we're trapping over here inside, I never want that to render, so I'll turn that off immediately. And we need to, I want to blob these together. It'll slow us down a bit, but that's definitely a goal of mine. That does mean I probably need to separate these out. So. This sphere becomes a null. That null now contains the cubes. Delete the sphere, delete the cubes. So now these live separately, but they're doing the same layout. And that now means that I have the ability to modify one or the other. I'll make one larger just for fun. In fact, this could now, like I said, we could now have it not get fed the random. They're completely separate rigs. So those are still being affected by gravity and those cubes will want to fall down. I think, yep, yeah, they should be. Exclude nothing. So yeah, the cubes fall down. These are all blobbing around doing their thing. So now that they're separate rigs, we can feed this into a, save it, volume builder, volume mesher, hit play. And as long as, I found this out yesterday actually. Um, and actually it looked like it was being a little weird. Yeah, it, there's gonna be some slight refresh issues, but these will all blob together now. Um, but the individual cubes should be still trapped in their individual little shapes. So we can let these blob together in whatever way we want them to. Um, by creating a dilate, we can actually expand that a bit. I've been really like you, you <clears throat> liking using dilate a bit. So that can inflate everything a, a little bit. And we could create some smoothing. I'll just create a smoothing deformer. It calculates really quick and does a lot of what I wanted to do. It's not perfect. It'll be some edges that are weird. Really, the only way to get around that is to create more resolution for their voxels. So now we mostly just need to cut off the faces of this. And that just requires some sort of fall off. Actually, I'm saying we should do it in Redshift, but does Redshift have... What's the equivalent of a proximal in Redshift? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, Michelangelo, I'll try and address that when this one's done. Um, so if we do try and do this in Redshift, and I would like to, I'm, I'm trying to you know, do more Redshift just in general to be more informed on that. Uh, we'll start out with a dome light, feed in that same HDR. Uh, don't copy it over. Don't worry about the sky. That should give us something to render. Open up our red or open up render settings. Turn on red shift. Turn on. That can all stay really low. GI, yes please. Brute force, brute force. All these basics are fine for us to visualize certain things. Save this again. As soon as I add in red shift, I will say underscore red shift so people know that are getting the scene files. 
All right, this material does nothing. This guy does nothing now. Create a new, and here's something that I suggest everybody who's using the third-party renderers start doing, and that is do not use the built-in node editor if you don't have to. Instead, just create a new, make sure your node space is set to your renderer. So I'm gonna set it to Redshift. And then I can say create material, create node material, and that is now a Redshift node material. So applying that to our blobs, this is now a Redshift material that we are seeing in the viewport. Opening, double clicking, it will open up the new Cinema Node Editor. And this is now Redshift, which is fully integrated here. Everything you do in the Redshift Editor, we can do here, but it's just a better interface overall. So, um, yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking, Pierre, but nobody is thinking, nobody's got a proximal idea. We could feed in vertex maps, but um, what if we, what's the equivalent of a fall off? Oh, that's just a direction. That is not something that I am equipped to talk about. Not at all. How do we make, what I want, we're in Redshift, but what I want to do is, how would I do the equivalent of this? Oops. How would I do the equivalent of a fall off? The fall off is a vector. So how do we do this in Redshift? Because I could say, hey, I want this to be black on the bottom half and white on the top half. And it's just purely based on the rotation. I know that there's a node in Redshift, but I'd have to be hunting around to do it. And just to show you, if I drop this in, and hit render. I don't think we're in redshift. Yeah, you can see that the, well, actually that's supposed to be the angle that's doing it. Wait, is that redshift popping in there? Yeah, I did set it to redshift. So if I put that on standard, you can now see that the angle is determining it. I was gonna put it on the front. Tobias, <laughs> you, uh, Tobias, you go do a live stream and talk about Arnold, I will not be. <laughs> I got nothing against it, but I'm going to use whatever that's closest to vanilla cinema. There is no render wars here. Uh, ramp. Well, ramp is a gradient. Ramp. This is not a, I don't know if you guys were saw it, but this isn't a gradient. This is a fall off, which is very different than a ramp. And I think a ramp is just a gradient. I could be wrong, so I will pop it open and check. Um, I have to go back to Redshift to make this actually show up. So I will try making a ramp. And we'll see if I was misremembering this. Typically, I'd be using two monitors here, but during a live stream, it's supposed to just be one. Mm, source, auto, alt, mapping, vertical. Yeah, I don't see a direction here, everybody. This is just a ramp. Yeah, uh, Apple's saying something like it's some sort of like facing ratio or something. Um, that is not what this is. There's an entire thing, what's it called? Yeah, see this is why I typically don't talk about state. It, like the state gives us a lot of information. So we can get the normal information, the geometry, the tangent. One of these, like ray direction might be it, but then we have to split it. So we can take a color splitter take the ray direction output like just one of them and that might be sort of what we're going for redshift render view make sure we are rendering in redshift turn that on and delete th this material okay so that is outputting the red channel into the entire surface not really giving us much. Let's try the green channel. Oh, there's a little, there's a little something. There's a little hint of something happening up there. So this now needs a ramp, I think. So let's try feeding that into the input probably. Is it the source? Let's try source. That should, oh, well, immediately it did something. Um, is source the correct thing to feed that into? What else would there be? I think it's probably source. 
Um, so now this ramp could be used to, but see, this seems to be absolute in world space. Ray, pos yeah, see, ray direction, that's behaving more like I would think ray position would be. <laughs> yeah, th this would just turn into plugging in different nodes and seeing if something actually was outputting what I expected to. Why isn't it visually changing? I mean, apparently it's just saying that's no, fine. It could be something as simple as normal, but why are none of those updating? Ah, um, I'm not saying it's complicated. I just don't inherently know what it is, and it's not. Uh, it's not. It's not outputting what I was expecting. Yeah, you see, we get these normal directions. I thought the color splitter would do a good job for us, but it's really outputting. Ooh, ooh, did I just do it by accident? The green channel of the normal, and now we get the top. So does that mean if we output B? I was just about to give up, and then suddenly it worked. Yeah, look, okay, cool. Um, now I've got a particular direction. That's what I was looking for. So if I output blue into the source, I can remap it. No, that just goes to the top and bottom. Does this need to be mapping? No. All right, well, the ramp, the texture space, that's the source. Um, apparently there's a redshift fall off node. Is that what we're talking about? Fall. Yeah, if I search for fall, there's no fall off, so nope. Do, do, do. Anyway, I can just remap. Remap. Nope, not remap. It's uh, range. Change range, please. So we'll grab the blue channel, put it into the input. Output that as our surface. And now that's all over there. But now I could do whatever I want with the remapping. I need more screen real estate. Okay, render, you're getting real tiny. So if I were to invert this, hopefully we'll see it flip to the other side. So that's now the illuminated side. And then if I, let's see, that'll lower everything. That will, okay, start pulling this down and now we can start making there be more in the black color. Pull this, yeah, there we go. pull that down. Now we get really high, heavy contrast. If I wanted it to just fade, yeah, there we go. So I can do something like that. Yeah, so this remapping is pretty much working the way I wanted it to. And we could really limit where those windows are. And that's my thought. That just becomes the mask of where the transparency is. And now, beep, we're outputting the material this is just a mask so give us our material back and now we get the material that material can be whatever we want let's say it is a nice bright color again and it's nice and shiny that's pretty much fine default a little blurriness why not then well i guess i don't know a lot about transparency in redshift but hopefully we can just do the um, the opacity that's the goal so feeding this into the overall opacity okay it's backwards also it looks like we're getting a front and back does that make sense i'm not sure that it does but that's kind of funny because we just remapped it but now let's see if i can invert that input output and reset reset and now this should just flip it there we go now the front has become transparent but it's not that's not where like refraction is yeah it's that's not like a layer on top of it so i must need to manipulate this differently and with redshift how do you get how do you get like a basic refractive material going i guess it's just this um. <laughs> I don't want to feed that into opacity. I want to feed it into 
Well, let me turn that off. And I think this is just the, yeah, that's the transparency there. So that's all we need to change. So we need to change the weight of the refraction and transmission. So we'll feed this in. Refraction. Nope. Um, refraction, transmission, weight. Okay, it's backwards again, which means our original should be fine. There we go. Now it's shiny on the front. We are getting it on the front and the back. Given our normal direction, I would think that that would only be single direction, and not two direction. But you can't see that it is doing something. Oh, no, it's not back there. Is it? That's interesting. Is it also... Uh, it's not really showing us the interior. Is that just shiny? If anybody knows what I'm attempting to talk about here, feel free to add clarifications in. Because it's not seeing through to the other side, but maybe it requires thickness to do that. Um, or two shaders. As soon as we get into the stuff, it gets crazy. But that's interesting. It's refracting, but it's not seeing the object itself. But I know a lot of I know a lot of renderers don't see like the other side of the normal. It wants like two sides of the geometry. Uh, what's interesting is that the cubes should still be there. We should be able to see those cubes. So creating a new redshift. Actually, no uh, material node material. Those can be on the cubes. And just for heavy contrast, I'll make it red. How about an orange? A red orange. Yeah, see these cubes are not, those cubes are not showing up in the inside. Why not? Boop. They're there. but they're not here. So does that implying that these are not refractive, but instead are reflective? <laughs> I already did opacity. Mm. Ray switch mode has front and back support. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of suggestions. This is just over my head right now for something very specific. And I don't want to waste anybody's time with something I'm not super familiar with. So maybe in the bonus stream, I can have some people walk me through that detail. Or I'll just look into it separately. So I'll save that. We d Yeah, we got some stuff working. But I'd be curious to get it to work front and back. And then we'd limit it in a way... It's funny how it was tricking me. I thought that uh, the back was getting it. I'm glad we figured out the normal direction at least. Um, yeah, I might, uh, I guess for fun, because hey, if we're doing this on a live stream, I am going to post this in the live stream channel on the Rocket Lasso Slack. So, if somebody wants to fix this file in the simplest way possible and it'd be like, hey, I got it working. Just post it back in the Slack channel and then message in the, the main chat. Don't add me in the Slack channel. I'm not going to look at that unless I see the message pop up in the current live stream chats. But uh, let me just pop that open. Uh, scene files. If you're on the Rocket Lasso Slack channel, then you'll now see this file pop in. Send. And that is that. All right, um, somebody had a follow-up question. Um, oh yeah, Michelangelo was asking about when it comes to the spacing of objects, if there's like a way of doing it with num. And yes, it is true that there is a kind of a cool thing with num. And I'll create a couple of different objects here just so we can see them. If I were to select all of these, you can space them out evenly, but it is, well, I guess it's in a, it depends on how you want to do it. But let's say that they did all have like these random heights and you wanted to maintain like these different random heights, but you, or 
how do I want to say this? Let's say we wanted these all to line up. We wanted to maintain their weird heights, but I want them to each get spaced out an even amount traveling along X. If I selected everything, we've got a bunch of different X's. I could just say num times 200. And now it's taking the index of the current object and then multiplying it by 200. So uh, the figure is the first object. So that would be zero times 200, which means it'll go at zero and then 200 and then 400. It's going to do 200, 200 per. So if I enter, then now everything is keeping its alignment. It looks like it goes from top to bottom. Sorry. So you can see everything's got its different uh, Y positions. But if I select this, you can see that the X is zero and the next one will be 200 and then 400 and 600 and then 800. So yeah, you can type in num and get different numbers there. In this case, if we want them all aligned on zero, I just say zero on Y, those all get aligned. So now it's 200 across, but we could also say num times 333. And now there's 330, oop, not num. Yeah, num times 333, not X. X is great because we can take the current number. Let's say, yeah, I like this ratio but I want it to be double the amount. So I could say X times two, and this will all double their current spacing. So yeah, this is just, just another way of arranging things. Uh, ba -ba -da -ba -da. Let's see. How can uh, O Da D official has a question saying how can I control individual MoGraph cloner? Which one is inside some moving elements nested inside a cloner? Like if a cloner, MoGraph cloner with a MoGraph cloner side of it that runs individually from the other one. Uh, I'm not entirely sure I'm following. Um, I'm not sure I'm entirely, entirely following, but you can affect things with a cloner inside a cloner. It's actually pretty crazy that we can. Let's create a, let's do the simplest example I can think of. So we'll make a cube, which is 10 by 10 by 10. And I'm tired of everything being generic gray. So let's add in a nice yellow. That goes into, actually, I think the cloner, got, it won't overwrite it nice. Okay, so grid array, let's set this to eight by eight by one. So now we have this grid. The spacing should just be 11 by 11 by 11. So now we get this nice grid. That cloner gets fed into a second cloner. And this one, I'll set it to one by one by eight with spacing of 11. So now I've made this grid is made of a series of copies of this. So having done that, I mean, I know we could make this with a different type of grid, but I intentionally separated this way to keep it nice and clean and simple. Now, let me see if this works. If I were to create a plane effector and say that it should scale them to an a uniform absolute negative one. So everything's getting scaled to zero. And then I say within a spherical fall off. And I pull this away. You'll immediately see, uh, let's see, actually, no, you see this one, this is where it gets interesting. Do you see how this isn't affecting any of these cubes? Because this cloner is a series of copies of clones of the original shape and that means the center of the axis so like this the ax center of this slice is the only thing that cares so because we're feeding this in this upper cloner nothing is affected until this reaches that midpoint and then suddenly they get affected and the entire row is getting selected the entire slice is i'm not sure about this but if we go into the first cloner which is just creating these cubes and drop it in we get a very what i consider unexpected but very powerful effect and that is now it's affecting every clone. It's not just, you would think, here's what I would think would happen. Imagine, and actually, does it do it if we make it a, 
child. Let's group that and make that a child. Yes, it does. Okay. So that's where it's really powerful. Here's what I would actually expect. If we were to turn this off and I put this in, here's what we're actually creating. We're actually creating this byte out of it. So if we were to make a cloner and copy it, and I will visually hide this. If I were to turn on this cloner, I would expect this to happen. But that's not what happens. If it's not part of this hierarchy, MoGraph is smart enough to calculate this externally. And now every single one of those clones, in spite of being a cloner inside of a cloner, is being individually calculated by this field. And that is crazy powerful. So you can, you can really layer things up on this. Now, the original question was sort of scrolling. Uh, the original question was, yeah, cloner within a cloner that runs individually from other from the other one. Yeah, see, that's where you lose me on the other one. But now you can see that we are affecting clones within a cloner or clones within a cloner within a cloner, which is really powerful. The And then you can affect it from outside objects by doing anything. Like this is a field fall off, but this plane could be driven via anything. I could create a cube and scoot the cube to this corner and say, okay, plane, you also are seeing this cube as some sort of effect. And if I say that it should be seeing this cube on the top, I want this to be affecting the volume. Then now you can see that the cube is what is doing the effect. So if I were to take this cube and move it, you can see wherever this cube is intersecting, it's going to take the bite out of it. So that is now affecting every clone within a cloner within a cloner. And it's really easy to erase things out and create uh, things like that. Unless you can get more specific with the question, that's as far as I know how to take that. But it's pretty cool that just by changing that hierarchy in a slight, slightly different way, we can actually affect clones within clones. I don't know that we wouldn't be able to, but I wonder if you do clones within clones within clones. But I'll save that. Mm -hmm -hmm. Cloner in cloner. Um, let's see, scrolling. Oh, uh, Tyrone is asking why I'm not partner on Twitch. It's actually kind of funny. There are like four qualifications you need and you need a certain number of people watching, a certain number of hours, a certain number, uh, like a bunch of different things. But then they also have a requirement, which is like you have to stream at least three days a week. And I do stream three days a week, but only one of them is on Twitch. So, um, but I, I super meet the other qualifications. So if I bug them, I could probably, uh, I could probably get partnered on Twitch. I do know people there, so I should just poke them at some point. I should make a note of that too. Uh, get partnered on Twitch. That'd be fun. Uh, I started looking into it last year, and I just kind of forgot. Uh, but, 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 uh, I think I saw that Crossfader had given me an updated version of my file. So let's pop it open and reverse engineer and see what we've got. Um, so this is the... Oh, you gave it thickness. That's automatic. I don't want to say this cheating, but that's uh, that's going outside of the context I was doing it. But like I said, some renderers will do that. But de depending on the thickness you gave it, oh, and you did a lot of nodes. Um, so you did the state, the normal, the color splitter, which is what I did, the change range, which is, oh, those are all just my nodes. You just reorganized them. Um, and then you did a material blender. Ah, that's nice. Yeah, so... There are two materials now. Here's a transparent material and a solid material. And using the setup I had done as a mask to blend between them, now you end up with two separate materials. But, uh, and I'm going to temporarily turn off the cloth surface to demonstrate what I think is happening. So, yeah, you get those two materials doing their thing. Uh, why are the cubes escaping? Give me a moment to... Just make sure our cubes are hanging out inside. Uh, we didn't see the cubes. Some of that looks a little bit weird, but then you were turning on this cloth surface and that gives the entire thing thickness. Um, and that thickness probably makes it so that these lenses can be refractive. But is it seeing, is it seeing through? See, that's where I'm confused. Oh no, wait, 
Yeah, I am confused because what is this even doing? Why are we seeing these big black sections in the back? Because that is now a transparent window and it's going inside and then it's what reflecting and seeing the back of the window. If I turn on the dome light, um, turn on the dome light and feed it that HDR again, is it now going to, are we seeing through it? Yeah, see, we're seeing through it. That's the part I'm confused at. Why are we seeing through it? Even in your rig, you can see that the this rust, you can see that uh, we're seeing right through that to the rust. So it's not seeing the other object, even with that cloth surface. If I move this up, it's still doing the same thing. So yeah, that's not... Uh, well, if somebody else has a thought, like I said, I posted that in... I posted it in the uh, Slack channel, so you can see. You, and we have to be careful with this type of thing because of, um, I, I appreciate the efforts, but that didn't do the end result. So I don't want to be, I just want to make sure if somebody's like, oh, here's a simple solution. But uh, everybody has an answer and everybody's shouting different things in the chat originally. So um, it, gets, uh, it gets tricky to, be, to know what answer to pursue, if any. But yeah, getting some Rocket Lasso Twitch emo emotes would be really nice. Get some Pepe's going. Um, Pete's. Oh, yeah, yesterday in the bonus stream, somebody had a question, but I said it'd be a better question for today's stream. What was the question? As mentioned yesterday, any thoughts on modeling a realistic cushion with wrinkles? Oh, a well, see, that's new information. A realistic cushion with wrinkles that reacts with a sofa or chair that it's resting on. Um, the wrinkles part of it is... The potentially tricky part. What's the uh, wrinkle technique? We figured this out recently. There was a wrinkle technique. Let me see if I can remember that. This could be kind of weird, but we'll give it a go. Make a cube. Subdivide to 5 by 5 by 2. And then I want to double those, so times 2. Boop, boop, boop. Okay, so we got not, eh, I'm gonna double again. So not crazy high poly. I will make a duplicate of that because I'm gonna wanna copy in a second. So mm, I think we have to make that editable. And then I'm going to make a loop selection. Loop, loop, and loop. That should, oop, and loop. Okay, so I've selected all the corners. Right click. Mm, we can probably even do it with a soft body, but let's try doing it with cloth. Cloth, I think, is a better idea. Simulation. Cloth. And we can fix the current selection. So those are our stuck. I don't want any gravity. Thank you, gravity. And then we have uh, tag size. That's what we actually want to keyframe. So I'm going to keyframe size and then go forward 40 frames. And we'll say it's going to be way too much, but we'll say 150. And now rewinding and hitting play, these parts will inflate and they're stuck on these corners. So everything is pushing outward. Now I do want everything to push the correct direction. So I suppose we can add a force a tractor cloth forces no expert limit to add the attractor that's going to pull everything in but a strength of negative 10 should push out and we just have to keep on increasing that yeah so now you can see i'm starting to push out and it doesn't have to be too big i just want them not to be wrinkling in so the goal here is to kind of make something that gives us some wrinkles, but they're still pinched in these corners. Um, there's some, there's better, potentially better techniques for that. I'm trying to remember specifically, but you can kind of see how we're getting a bit of a cushion there. I wonder, let's try subdividing it one more time. Why not? Polygons, I think the cloth is gonna fight us on this. Let's try subdividing. Yeah, the cloth fights us on that, but 
and then it's selected every other one. I'm completely fine with that. So, um, dresser fix every other one. So it's twice as subdivided. I don't want it to grow quite as much. So let's go to 125. And now there should be more geometry to work with. There we go. So you can get something that's kind of wrinkled and pushed. I, if we wanted to, let's see, can we make a box to trap this inside? I'll do that. And then shrink that. I wonder what that will do. So make this a cloth collider. Visually hide it. Let's see if it actually works. Um, I don't think it is. So it probably needs to be made editable, of course. Oh, that's still passing right through it. Hey, you're a cloth collider. Collide, will ya? Uh, let's try subdividing. US shortcut. That's passing right on through. Do we need to drag it in as a source? Expert. Hit that, please. Yeah, this seems to kind of... Uh, it, it did seem to react to it for a second, and now it's not doing a great job of reacting. I just wanted to square that out a little bit. Which I guess it maybe it kind of sort of is. It's not the it's not the best cushion. What am I missing there? Oh, yeah, I mean, it does work, but... Uh, well, put in a good word, Brawlius. <laughs> um, yeah, if I don't... Shrink it that much. There's more settings. Somebody's got a really nice tutorial on this cloth thing. Um, it's honestly one of my favorite tutorials that anybody else ever made. Where it's like, I don't know, it's a really simple technique. I like it. Um, I think if we just delete the tag, yeah, now this becomes a permanent geometry. So let's just call that our wrinkled cushion. And now you're saying you want that to react by falling on something else. I would just go with a low poly proxy. It's not to... Uh, not to do a cop out here, but that becomes our geometry. We don't need the attractor. Uh, maybe we can get rid of the box because we got better ways of doing this now. If I were to take this and copy and paste, because why not? This will be, we'll have a big old fluffy bed. And this is a cushion, a pillow falling on the big old fluffy bed. That's the thought. Now, running the simulations of these would take way too long. It would take a really long time to calculate overall. Don't want that. So we make low poly proxies, which is all the easier in cinema these days. We have two different things we can do. Although I am sort of inclined to, we want the original. So I'll copy paste a copy. And this one I would like to well, I'm going to feed into a volume mesh, a volume builder, into a volume mesher, and we should get, uh, I would like it to be a little overinflated, not much, but I will create a dilate so that it gets big enough that it's pretty well encapsulating the entire thing, and that's pretty good. Let's make that editable, and then feed that into the new, newly integrated, I should say, a remesher. So that gets fed into the remesher. And if I hide this pillow, then now you can see that this remesher is going to remesh that into this. And we could even say, hey, let's start going a little easier on those polygons. And we can, the lower we can go, the better. So like, honestly, even something like that is pretty good. Like very, very low poly. Very low poly. And yeah, I'm fine with that. Let's make that editable. You see how quick it is to do that sort of process. Now, I guess I should have made that a rig. I could have applied to both of them. But let's just do that process again on um, the bed that gets fed the volume builder, volume mesher, resolution 20. Oop, that's a builder and a builder. Builder and the builder, volume mesher. Yeah, that's pretty good. And then that can be directly fed into the remesh. Drop this down to, what, 11? 8? That's pretty good. 5? Yeah, we should be able to get away with that. So those become the two shapes. I mean, there's a good chance we keep that parametric, but I just want this to go quick. So this will be, yeah, it's the remesh. This is remesh bed. And that's the cushion. 
and the remesh cushion. Okay, cool. Give this a quick save. Find one. Cushion. Okay, so what do we need? I believe, I mean, this is going to be really weird, but that the load density here will go a long way. The cushion needs a do 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 mesh. The cushion is going to view the cushion remesh. Advanced, make sure to see the external surface. Initialize, please. And then this one does the exact same thing. Mesh, bed, remesh. Check out the surface. You have to do this in case any points did escape. Hit initialize. But these meshes should be pretty dang accurate overall. And you can see that these other ones have been modified so we can see them showing up pretty well. So that means now these remeshes can be fed soft bodies. Presumably we'll need a floor. I kind of wish that we still saw the floor. They changed it so that the floor doesn't show up in the viewport. That just gets a collision. And we'll make a light so we can see contact points. Shadow. Options. Show the shadow, please. Copy paste. Yung. Yung. Bum, bum. So now we got high poly, low poly, and save it. Gravity, everything's turned on. These are probably going to be really squishy, but let's hit play. Bloop. And now we have a cushion on the cushion. And you see how super crazy fast that runs. And we get all of our detail. All the detail of the high poly cushions. But they can still react with each other. It actually worked better than I thought it would. Um, we And then all the properties are really easy to work with here. Um, changing. We don't want to change the structural. But we could change the shear and the flexion. Those should really be able to flatten out now. Blurp. Super squishy. Um, let's tell it to do a lot of volume conservation. Boing. So these are uh, these don't want to get deflated now. So yeah, there should be a little pressure, but now you can see it's kind of squishing around. Might roll off. Yep. Goodbye. Um, uh, potentially, this would be a kind of situation where you could go with a little bit of stiffness. Um, And then I don't need too much volume conservation. A little goes a long way. Yeah, actually, a little goes a really long way. I'm never, I'm never sure what the volume conservation default is. Even at one, that seems to be pretty intense. Oh, stiffness is now counteracting us, though. So, okay, yeah, I was giving, yeah, but even one. You see, one on the volume conservation does a good job of keeping it. But that, there's a really nice fluffiness to that overall, I think. And that should be depressing that down a little bit. Yeah, look at the little pit it makes. That's what I was trying to go for. So you get the little pit happening in there. And I think that, yeah, that's just a deformer on there in there. So I could even throw that into a volume. I could put that into a subdivision surface now. These. And now the dynamics in no way are calculating on those. I don't think we need to see two, two. So let's just, just do one. And that's, this should run pretty much at the same speed. So now we have a cushion with wrinkles settling in very nicely. Very beanbag-esque. Um, with a crazy, super fast uh, running meshes. Copy paste the pair of them. Um, copy paste the pair of them. There we go. So as long as you copy paste the matching pairs, you probably put them in at all. But those you should be able to copy paste them. Now they are duplicatable. Squish. Obliterated. Hmm, anything else to do on this one? Anything cool to do on it? Pressure would inflate it. Structural stops it from stretching. Flexion and shear are just good variables for how bendy it is. The damping goes a long way for bounciness. If we put those dampings down to zero, then it should be very squishy. Yeah, this is gonna be more like a waterbed now. All I did was take the damping, damping, damping and put them down to zero. And now you can see that it's going to be super squishy. 
Like it's going to be bouncing around. They're no more squishy than they used to be, but the, the energy is not getting drained out from the scene. So those are doing, it's a, I don't know, it's a lot bouncier. It's fun. Um, the volumes are still being maintained. It's still settling down slowly. Like just the nature of multiple springs being connected, they kind of drain energy from each other. But it's not actively draining energy from them. Uh, meanwhile, if we just put those back to like 555, that should go back to a pretty middle ground on there. There'll be some squishiness on it, but a lot less. Uh, and then I guess the point of contrast would be going up to something like 99, 99, 99, 99. Once again, this is on damping. This isn't on the actual setting. As I've mentioned, damping is often way more important than the actual setting. More than sheer inflection is the shears damping. You see how much just changed just by based on how much energy was allowed to follow through or not. So pretty cool. The volume also has damping so we could probably lower that and the volume could itself be bouncy and squishy Blurp. I like this big one being really fluffy but I kind of want these cushions to be maintaining their stiffness a little more so let's jump those to 25 25 and I immediately see those try and <laughs> snap back into their shape this should go a long way uh, and then they're not I guess they are trying to maintain their pressure but that volume conservation i do feel like it was getting squished way more than should be allowed luckily i still have pretty good intuitions on the way these soft bodies work yeah that volume there we go that pushed down a lot more so that was being maintained and yeah pretty cool just sort of working and it's it's amazing how right in your brain, you just stop. It doesn't feel like we're running this on a saw, on a low poly version of it. And by using the volume builder and then now the remesher, which does a really good job of giving us very evenly sized polygons, we can unhide those again. We can see the meshes that we're actually running on are so low poly that we're getting pretty good frame rates here. I mean, I'm getting about half real time, but that's running really well, really quickly. It's really good for us to be able to experiment on. And at any point, if it's not enough resolution for you, you could have go back to your original mesh. And like I said, it's possible we might not have even had to make those editable. It would be taking a while to recalculate, you know, if you reopen the file and whatnot, because that's rebuild. But you could double the resolution on these and have twice the detail. Just have to keep in mind that when there's double the resolution of a mesh, like even just on one direction, then your settings here are having double the effect because there's twice as many springs. So each one, you know, if you have one spring, you say you can bend 10%, but then you make two springs to say you can both bend 10%. That means they could bend up to 20 total. So as you have a lower mesh, you can use more reasonable numbers here. As you have bigger meshes, you have to start cranking these numbers crazy high to make them compensate. Um, but yeah, quite pleased with that as a little test. Uh, I like this type of thing. Whee. Give uh, let's give the cushion. Let's take this bottom cushion and throw it up into the air a little bit. So dynamics, custom velocity, linear. Let's throw it up by five five five, which should be reasonable. Yeah, that's very reasonable. Let's even go one one one, and we'll take the top one and we'll give it some spin. I'm not sure x z x y z. So let's say two two two. Spin, bonk. Yeah, just giving it that little, well, just that little bit's probably enough to fling them both off of the uh, the cushion. But yeah, super fun stuff. I like it. Let's fling this one downward, minus five, five, five. Bring. See ya. Uh, yeah, I'll save that one there. What time is it? Yeah, we got time for another question, I think. Um, Eric, that is one that we've tackled a lot of times. Uh, hang on. Uh, Mick was asking if we could apply this to a fist punching a face. Um, the tricky part goes in. You couldn't, I don't think you could do it too well 
these are like free floating objects. So I don't really have the ability to take this object and like tug it in a particular direction that much. The point being is if that was like a head on a neck on a body and you just kind of wanted to apply this effect on the face, I wouldn't do it with this technique. I'd actually go and do it with our very first technique today which was the jiggling water effect. So if you, you could apply this collision deformer with a jiggle, and then if something collided with the face, you could actually have the ripples uh, come out from that. So you could do this on the face here, and that would run really well. So that's what I would suggest if you're going to do something like punching a face, you would uh, use a collision and the smoothing. I'm not sure if you heard it earlier, but you check out the replay. Um... Anyway, back to Eric's question. Oh, wait, some other people have more questions here. Oh, uh, Pete's saying it doesn't look like a real cushion. Stiffen up the sides. Uh, yeah, Pete, the... Uh, mm, I'm not sure. I mean, I guess it, it, I would need like an image of the cushion you're talking about and whatnot. But yeah, the stiffness just goes a long way here. Like you're saying, stiffen it up. But even on these two, if we just said, okay, that's a big fluffy bed, but then these two cushions are going to be pretty stiff, then it just goes to the settings we were playing with. Like I said, let's drain out the energy so they are not inclined to bend that much. If you put pressure on, they will bend. Oops, that's supposed to be 25. That's supposed to be 99. And then a little stiffness goes a long way. 0.5 stiffness is probably too much. But you see, as those collide, do you see how those are like, nope, don't want to really pass through. Just by changing those couple settings. A stiffness of 100, once again, they will be able to bend a little bit as they collide, but they really want to return to their shape. So you can manually, I mean, I could just by changing those settings, like really stiffen those up quite a bit. So it depends on like what they're filled with or what the structure of them is. Uh, on top of that, you could start weighting it with vertex maps. Um, an important thing to note, and we've talked about this before, I'm not going to do a whole demonstration on it, but if you make a vertex map, you can't just make, let's just say you painted this ring. Let's say you wanted this to be, I'm kind of tracing an edge outline. Let's say you wanted those edges to be really stiff. And you just paint a vertex map where you paint those points. That would not work. You could, springs don't work on a single set of um, a single line here. You'd actually have to paint that row of points and an inner row and an outer row from it. So if I painted this, this, and this, then those could become stiff. But you can't just do a single row. You have to do three in a row. Um, Yeah, definitely give it a little bit of thickness. And yeah, vertex maps are multipliers. So you do something like take the structure or even the stiffness. That'd be kind of weird. But you could take the stiffness and say, hey, it's really stiff, like 10. And then make everything really yellow. And that would mean it's full power. And then paint some of it, be, some of it to be slightly red. And that would become like a 50%. 50% of 10. If you go all the way to full red, then it'd be 0% stiffness. And that part could be way floppier. So that would also work. And stiffness, actually stiffness probably, I will do this. Stiffness, I think, would be very... Uh, this mesh I did isn't super... Uh, lining up with the object everywhere, so I can't perfectly grid it out. We could have modeled something to do that, but um, let's see, what do I want to say is really stiff here? I guess we can just do an outline-ish thing. So just, I'll just do that. Let's just say that ring will be really, really stiff. So select set vertex weight to 100%. Now, everything else is set to zero that this ring is 100 everything else is zero so if i wanted to i'd have to select all or invert my selection and say go to set vertex weight again and give it some amount or it's zero stiffness i'm going to leave it at zero and let's just see if i say okay cushion you are super stiff except for almost everywhere so except for that one ring yeah except for that one ring everything is really is not stiff. So let's just see what that does. Burn. Uh, oh, I did a lot of things to make that not squishy. So let's uh, chill these out so they get squishy again. Squish. That actually goes, that goes a long way to controlling everything. Let's look at it in the back. Bunk. The stiffness should be an absolute value. 
Yeah, you see that corner bent in, but the overall square is being super maintained right now. It's a it's a tricky, somewhat specific artistic thing, perhaps. I don't know. I mean, if you get more specific than that, you have to give me more specific examples. But that's as far as I can go on that right now. Uh, I don't want to keep those changes, though, so I'm just going to revert to saved. Do, do, do. Yeah, I'll go check that file out at the very end. I want to see if there's any more questions. Um, yeah, oh yeah, back to Eric. Uh, how would you animate pages turning in a book? That is not something I've ever gotten a super happy result on. It's a fairly common question. A lot of it just goes to how do we to form a single page to even look good. Like assuming you have a plane and let's do a standard uh, 1100 by 800, so eight and a half, oh yeah, 850. So that's like a standard sheet of legal document, uh, ratio, not literally. Um, and I wouldn't want to do this with like dynamics that's the nightmare to think of all those different layers so it would turn into deforming this to flip over but how would i let me try something if no that doesn't make sense because here's the trick is we needed to transition multiple things Man, it's so tricky Okay, we'll put the bend inside, rotate it, 90, fit the parent. So if we were to increase the strength, oh, that is, what? Did I not rotate it? I did rotate it. What? Am I crazy? Why did, what is, Wait, fit the parent. That should stretch out. Oh, th is the alignment... Oh, did they make it so that the rotation alignment... Aw. Aw. Let me see. So, the Z. Do I have to set that to Z X plus and say fit the parent now? Aw, they changed the way it works. Oh, I, I, well, I'm not saying that's a bad method. I'm used to rotating it, but now it looks like that's something they changed. So, okay. Anyway, so in the way I've set this up, I would want that to animate... But here, here's the tricky part, because essentially what we need this to do is bend over, but then bend back again to flatten. At the same time, it's spinning from one side to the other is our trick. So creating a null, hold down shift, move it back. I guess, yeah, that's the correct amount. So I'm not going to be too nuanced with this. At the time of zero, we keyframe a page at... 10 frames in, we'll bend it over a bunch, keyframe. And at 20 frames, we zero back out again, keyframe it. And then this null at the time of zero will be on B. So keyframe B. And then at 20, that will have flipped to negative 180. So the combination of those two things sort of, but yeah, immediately it's, it's where it gets tricky. It's like we need to offset these keyframes because it's doing both at the same time. And then that overshoots before it straightens out. So it's kind of like we want that to wait a little bit and then the bend should finish early. So the bend begins and then the page starts turning and then it starts counter straightening out and then we finally go down, um, potentially even, you know, that could go back a few extra. And as we get here, potentially the bend even goes the opposite direction. So that can bend outward. No, that can settle now. If I'm bending outward, that can go here. Yeah, that makes more sense. Okay, so now you can see it bends out and then it's gonna kind of 
flatten itself out and counter bend and then lay. So you can see there's there's quite a few keyframes for how little we're doing. We now have we now have uh, six keyframes just for this singular page turning. In addition to that, we just set this up in a very linear way, I suppose. So it makes me also want to do something like a fall off. So making a linear fall off set to Mm. Oh, everything's rotated, so that's just nonsense. I'll just scroll until it's proper. Z plus, there we go, Z plus. So it also goes to while this is happening. I kind of want to be like, oh, as this bends, have this travel like that. So it's kind of like it can bend on one side before it does the other. I guess we could just leave it like that. Yeah, I mean, we could just manually do that, but this is all. This is a variable. We could keyframe this in so that it transitions from one side to the other. But now, at least you'll see it's bending. It's just going to bend this upper corner, and the rest sort of gets left behind, and then one page goes down. So it's sort of an animation of one page. There's a lot more we could do. We could remap this to be different. I'm not even sure how well the uh, volume is being maintained. This bend probably needs to keep Y length. Doesn't look too visually different there, but that all is getting that band. So yeah, I'm not sure to what degree some of that is accurate. So that's fine. All that stuff is keyframe. This should be controllable. Um, this one will be turn, which is important to put this into another null, alt G. And this null is at, well, its own local 000. I'll reset that to 000. That becomes one page. Put this into a cloner. And yeah, here's where things even, these get crazy. Because it's like, okay, all that seemed straightforward enough. And then we put into a group and we say, okay, let's just make a series of them. So we just offset them by a little bit. Let's put like two units in between each, make five pages. And, and we'll put a little more space just so we can, I'm going to exaggerate it. I'll even say 10 so that we can exaggerate the problem. Come on, 10. If I, they're all going to go at the same time right now. So obviously the first thing is we want to offset them in time. So MoGraph step, don't affect scale, affect time. And I have to go negative. So let's say negative 15. So now you can see all of those are getting offset from each other. I don't want to see the bend. All right, so first of all, if they are happening too close to each other, they'll start intersecting. So that's a problem. So this is not enough spacing from them to go, uh, but we could separate them. But now you'll see that when they flip to the opposite side, we get the next problem, which is they're all lined up here. But when I flip them to the other side, they are stacked backwards and they all pass through each other because a book has a more complex thing going on as it goes from one side to the other. So that makes me think that we don't animate the turn Let's kill off the turn. I went back to zero. They're not turning at all. They're just being offset in time. Um, we can keep going negative. We have to keep going negative until they don't pass through each other. Um, but then we need everything to be offset forward in time. So is there a setting directly for that in the cloner? Time. Yeah, okay, so I have to offset this. You see that that is set to 26. So if I set this to a positive 26, then it's the equivalent of offsetting that. That's nice. So now it does start here at the beginning. Oh, what is, oh wait, oh yeah, so now you see it's just up, down, up, down, up, down, because nothing's happening. But now as these pages should be turning, and they should be taking, I think, 20 frames to do it, and that's gonna be maybe a little challenging as well. These are all stacked, but now we'd want a, What do we want? This, I'm going to try making another step effector. This one won't affect position. It will affect rotation. Yeah, I don't even want this to be linear like this. I kind of had been thinking we could make it travel along a rail. Does that make sense? Let me kill the step effector. Here was the thought is make it shape a little bit more like a book. So if we make an arc, 
and I set that to 180, then these pages could all be cloned onto that. I don't wanna just set that to be the source. So instead, as a effort, as a, an F, as an attempt to make it work, I make an arc, which is fed into the cloner. The arc will be fed the spline, and that's gonna make everything want to align. Uh, we need an up vector. I'm not sure what the up vector is, so I will just guess. That seems to sort of be, let's put the end all the way down. Even that's not a good up vector. So all the rotations here are super messed up. Um, that doesn't really affect too much. What are we looking at here? Because we got a null and a null, I'm just trying to compensate by rotating our objects. Oh, wow, this is very unintuitive. Okay, that kind of puts us back where we were. Nothing is changing there. And now we do get a page that goes up and down, up and down, up and down. So if this is currently on start, if we allow these to start transitioning, I'm not even sure how I'd want to do this. We could probably do it with, is it set to loop? Why is it not going all the way? Start, end. Remember we, we had that uh, turn off the loop thing before, but there is no turn off the loop here. Ugh, relative to the spline, that's interesting. Um, but anyway, currently it's on step mode and I want it to be on fall off mode. Ooh, that did put them all on the end. So now you see all of them are transitioning from the beginning to the end. So it's in fall off mode. It should be viewing the fall off as the transition. And we, did, these are all initially offset. I'm not sure if this will work, but if we give the step a linear fall off, and the linear fall off is on Y. If I do, ooh, why does that? Oh, um, oh no, there's not a, mm. blah, 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 blah. So as soon as the, if we completely lose all power, it's just gonna disappear entirely. Uh, I would think that that wouldn't happen because we'd be clamping, but we just need to probably give it a little bit of a minimum. So I'm just gonna say add 1% or even like 0 0.001 and that, oh no, 0.01 is not enough. Let's say 0 0.01, no, 0 0.01. Oh, yeah, I guess 1%, but okay. So the book is slightly open. We could compensate in other ways. I don't wanna worry about that. But now it's always getting a little bit of power. And now the thought is as I pull this down, you can see the pages start flipping to the other side. So that gives us the other variable we need. They flip to the other side. I intentionally left that arc big because now we could shrink this down pretty small. Let's say five. So that's a really small arc. So they can all transition around. And now, how long does it take our pages to all get through their flip? I mean, this is something we'd have to manually change. Maybe there's a way we could compensate, but I'm not sure. That finishes on frame about 45. So the linear would be all the way up. Oh, and we really need to pinch this down. Uh, so the fall off here is a big variable depending on how close they get. But if I move it, let's just eyeball it here. So at the time of zero, this linear fall off is here on Y. And then at the time of 45, every it's done its entire animation. I want these just barely completed like that. Keyframe that. Now let's see what we get. Um, they're too close to each other. They're still passing through. So this fall off needs to be bigger. No, it needs to be smaller. Is that happening backwards? I think I might be doing it backwards. Does that make sense? Let's try Y minus, and we start below. Yeah, we'll do that. So we start below in keyframe. And then at the end, we travel up. Flip, 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 flip. 
and we end there. All right, that's a lot of rearranging, but let's see. Ah, no, something's still not quite working. What is even happening? I feel like I, I just reversed the order. I mean, it had to be one or the other, right? Hmm, maybe there's maybe there's additional variables here where I, they're flipping really quickly, but they need that same transition time. Yeah, they need to. Whew, there's a lot of little details there. And they're going backwards. Oi. Yeah, page flipping. I've never been a fan. This is a, uh, I mean, this is a law, a more logical approach, but we're still missing some detail here. Time is zero, that starts flipping up. But then it is not the one, that's not the page that's moving first. Now this fall off is traveling through this arc. And I wonder if that arc needs, well, I don't want it to be a bigger radius, but that's where the clones exist. Hmm, I don't know. You see the theory behind it, but something's mixed up. And it, it all ends up being so uniform. I'd want to like figure out a way that these pages could each flip slightly differently. I don't like this twisting motion on there. So you'd want a bend that is maybe bent in a slightly different way. I mean, of course, we could just turn that off and now it just becomes a, um, you know, the full page bends, which might be a little cleaner there. It doesn't change the problem we're having here, which is the timing. The timings are heavily affected by different things. And it's I don't like mixing... I don't like mixing these different modes where one is being controlled by a fall off, like a linear fall off, and the other is being controlled by a step. That I don't like that because those are two those are two systems that fight each other. And just where like one if we can make them both controlled via fields, that would be good. But they're not controlled by fields. This is controlled by a time offset. Now, if we could also make this step, this would be weird, but if this, oh, it's not step, this, if this spline also was controlled by a step and then we could keyframe that, could be interesting, but there's not, oh, there's not many controls in there. I thought there'd be a step offset, but there's not. Um, step that just offsets them they could be clamped it's going to remap everything that's underneath it so does that just make the pages turn okay let me think if that's one percent let's make another one that one's just to add everything up this one is to go negative 100 oh Okay. That stupid initial page flip, the compensating for that's causing us trouble. But ignoring that, you can see how this is actually flipping the pages in a slightly nicer way. We're stepping through the step. It's interesting that that we don't control the stepping in the step. We control it by the value we're going to feed into it. Um, but they, you see how they're each getting this very, they're getting a, how do we change the range? 200? Does that, how do we separate them more? Okay, yeah, we can. Does that mean we have to go extra negative? No, it's still 200, that's kind of nice. So you see how uh, this is this is more controllable. Like I said, ignore that one bad page, but um, the separation between each page is now just controlled by this number, not by like keyframing. Oh, that didn't reset that. Maybe there would be an additional variable, but it's not key. It's not. You can now see that uh, by doubling the number, there's twice as many pages in the space. It's not com It's not animated via a arbitrary thickness fall off that's being keyframed in arbitrary distance. It's now a very definitive and mathematical thing that's very, a lot more intuitive. I had really been hoping to uh, ignore that initial step, 
but now I feel like we need to do like relative to the spline and then rotate everything properly again. Let's see if we're lucky and that actually does what I think it did. Okay, that's better. Now, that's not great because not the only thing happening right now, this has nothing to do with... the keyframes but you can see here that if I let these flip they flip over pretty nicely but they still pass through each other like they're still going down to the opposite side so that is why is that because they are not aligned to the spline They are initially offset by some spacing, so we could zero that out, but now they're all in exactly zero spacing. So how do we add the spacing back in? Because I'll just flip them and they'll end up being flat and then be flat, which is something. But how do you put spacing in there? And then we'd need them all to be, everything I think of is not quite there. Like I was thinking we could put two straightaways on the corners of the spline, like offset them continuing forward and then let them live on that rail a little, a little bit. But that's the stepping doesn't allow for that. Hmm, I wanna see if there's anybody has any, any stuff I can, when you want to scale, paste an object. Yeah, Michelangelo has kind of an interesting idea, which is like if the most spline was doing the bending. But mm, I do like this rig we've got here. This doing the flipping is pretty good. And I think that we could even potentially feed the system through the stepping so we could time it with the animation as well. Step adds. Even if we could, uh, let's add another step. Add. What does that do? Can I? What do I actually want to do here? Turn that one off. Let's just look at this one. Yeah. So if I could do that, you see now there's a two two percent spacing on them. So if I add that on top, but why are they, why does it happen there? Blech. That confuses everything. If we could get that little 2% offset, Maybe you don't want to add, subtract. No, that's still, what is this one doing? Why is there just one hanging out here? Um, Not as, I would like if we got this working. What if I say normal? What if this is normal and we do that and then it's just set down to 2%. So that's an override. 
Now this is the primary one, but even if we go all the way up to, why is it looping? Is that because of my clamp? Yeah, clamp is important. Oh, but the clamp, that's overshooting. The normal isn't gonna be able to compensate for. Dang it. Um, this 2% is not going to do anything if we're in the world of clamp. Oh, wait, it could. If we clamp before it, yeah, clamp there. And now that is the normal one afterwards. So turn that off. What do we got here? arc 180 it's still doing that not quite overshooting thing so in order for that to look flat we'd have to go a little bit further but if we take the spline put that step on then you can see that i end up with some spacing on it to whatever amount i want to override so i can put some spacing in there so what that does mean in theory is we can do that overshooting of the arc so that uh, has to be made editable I'll do it kind of roughly, but if we zoom in, I'll just do a knife. I'm just going to go chop right there. Select the point, select the point, pull those down. So now you can see I've got this flat runoff. All right. Those flat runoffs would now be the landing zone for that step. So if the solid is at negative 100 then everything should be flattened out here now this is already on that's interesting there oh when i turned on this other mode relative to the spline that must be making it relative to the spline. But the somewhat good news here is you see the spacing that we've got? That's good. Because that should be this. If I turn that off, they're all in the same spot. If I turn it on, they're separated a little bit. So now if this value, which should be able to be exactly at 100, keyframe that, go up to 45, and now animate that over all the way yeah look at that so now they stack up properly on that side as well so that's what this is giving us it's it's like no no you have to have that little bit of fade away there's a bunch of straight away here we could this does not need to be so sharp and it, it does it's doing a big flap from one side to the other but if i could pull this up I, yeah i want to pull it up until i start seeing curvature and that's where i want to stop so that is all flat, but it is traveling really dramatically from one side to the other. It's relative to the spline, but is that just if I move this over here, that it'll like visually be lining up? Yeah, pretty much. So those pages are now correctly flipping over and there's spacing between them. Is it possible? I haven't even saved this. You know, I'm not digging a scene file if, or I haven't been digging the process if it's not uh page flipping I'm not thinking the process if I'm not saving it pretty often or I could be super into it and then be getting lost in it okay so uh, the kind of the last step I was sort of interested in is can we drive this step which is offsetting the time. Can we do that with the same technique? That's my question. So how do I do that? I'm not sure. Delete the step. I have that keyframes. Can I make a group field? Actually, I was having some trouble with this. Save it, group field, expand. If I make that a child of that, does it work? Okay, I think there was a bug in an older version of Cinema, but it's, they fixed it here. So that's good. So now that is a group field. So this is now the solid animating from negative 200 to 
from negative 100 to positive 100. So that is, that should work there. Uh, don't clamp. That's animated. Set that to normal. There we go. Okay, so those flip. Now, they have their own keyframes. I need them to be mapped on that group field. So, how do I do that? I think a plane effector. That is going to push them to negative 26. We might change that, but let's do negative 26 because that's what it used to be. And that's just going to be pushing them all back in time. But then that gets fed the group field, which could be really weird. They all bend pretty funky. We don't really seem to be doing anything, honestly. Also, let's keep in mind I did a time offset here. Let's reset that to zero. Oh, um, here's a thought. What if that's the time offset? I'm going to say that this shouldn't play, so I'm going to set this to fixed, so that's not changing anymore. And now their animation is entirely driven by this plane effector. So if I say that their keyframes, their 20 keyframes worth of animation happen because of a change in the plane effector. And actually, you can't see them happening right there. Bloop. So they're happening um, starting probably at frame. If I was predicting, it'd be half of 45. So right around here, they begin their bend and then flatten. And that's because we are feeding in a group field, which is at negative 100. There's no negative 100 keyframe. So that's why that's happening. So if we're feeding in the same thing, honestly, this should be keyframing from zero to 100. So I'll re-keyframe that. That'll make the animation happen right away. So you can see the bend will happen right away. And that means that once this gets fed into the spline, that's coming in raw from the group, but I can remap that. It makes sense to change the base and then remap after the fact. So that will just be that's coming in from 0 to 100, I want it to output negative 100 to positive 100. So the individual pages are all, they're all, the pages are all animated at the exact same time right now. They're all doing the same animation. We need to start offsetting those in time. So that's a group field. If we add the step effect in here and multiply. I don't think those will carry through all the way. What are we getting there? They need to be... A fraction, yeah. So this group field needs to be ramped as well. Because how many pages are there? I wonder if we can be mathematical with this. So there's five pages. So if we make this output divided by five, so it's 20%, that's going to animate really quickly. Or maybe we need to go 500. Does that animate really quickly? Yeah, they animate really quickly now. So if those then get offset by a step, But the step, add the step, don't clamp. Don't add the step, subtract the step. Whoa. Oh, there's some. Uh, we're close to something. There's going to be a very specific combination of things, and I don't have an intuition for mathematically what they'd be. I imagine it's got something to do with changing this max value to either 
times five or one fifth or some combination of that with its opposite. But then there also had to be some tweaks with the retiming. It's almost there and we're almost driving everything just with two keyframes. But I'm not sure which pages are flipping because the top one should be the first thing affected. But it starts moving first, but the second page is the first one that rotates. So we'd have to figure out some extra stuff there. Let's see. Um, there's We went further on this than I thought we would. I thought it would be immediately like let's dead end. I got sort of intrigued once we got this arc thing working. And this, this step offset, there's something here. But I, I, we still don't fundamentally have the page flipping working too well. The step effector, there's going to be some combination of per step. I just don't have a good intuition for the way the step works inside of the plane. Potentially that needs to get grouped and then remapped itself. That would be a weird one. I, I feel like the max could be changed. But like, why is the first page not affected? Or it is affected, but not until later? Like the first page is still straight. So that just means that the, well, if I turn off the spline, then we should see that it is the first page getting affected first, but it's just not, it's not moving quick enough. So that would have to go quicker. How would we keyframe? How would we make that move forward faster? Is that going faster if that increases? Seemingly, yes. That super slows it down. That would speed it up. So those are moving quicker, but then they need to be spaced out more. That spaces them out more. Yeah, see, those are two very controllable variables. So that's that's the bend out and then bend back down. Gets a little visually hard to understand what I'm seeing there, but I think it kind of makes sense. But why is the second one? See, I, I'm still getting lost there. The f first one is ah, it's there, we're so close to it doing something. The subtract is probably a culprit there. It has to be add or subtract, but it might need to like get grouped and then be add with a solid. But like at this point, I imagine that almost everybody watching is like, what the heck is even happening here? Um, there's just uh, there's too many crazy layers of things. That gets added, or the step is added on top of the other one. There's a lot of possible combinations to get the proper values and like visualizing those values to then translate them into this is, if I had it fully out in my head, I could explain it, but it's a lot of guess and checking. So I would just mostly lose people. Uh, yeah, Eric, it just goes to, it's a very popular question. And I knew that even engaging on it was going to lead us down this path. There is, we're close to something here. I'd have to think through this a little bit more, but I don't want to just be bouncing off the walls here. I'm sure I've lost most everyone um, because it is just like, what about this? What about this? What about this? And because I'm not sure the way the step is working, I can't explain it. And that's kind of my thing is being like, oh, I understand exactly how this works. So I can mechanically explain it. But without the intuition, I can't explain it. Um, there's something to explore there. I'm going to just call it for now. I don't know when I'll have time to tinker with it, but I would like to follow it up a bit because if we built the rig correctly, I think it'd be pretty simple to like add additional pages to it and make everything flip over correctly. Like even now, ignoring the rotating, you see that we're actually getting a really nice page flipping going on, like, or just the rotation of them is working fine. So, you know, potentially, potentially there's stuff there 
but that's for a future date. So uh, that's going to be the official end of that. Uh, some people put some uh, additional option or some extra renders in for that redshift thing. So if anybody's interested, um, people put in, yeah, a bunch of people, Paul, people who know what they're doing in redshift. So Zach was first. Um, let's see what Zach did. Pop that open. So first of all, let's just take a look at the result. Go. Yeah, there we go. We're seeing interior and exterior. Um, there's a volume measure. It doesn't look like you added any extra thickness on. So let's see. This is the material. Double click on this one. So you have a material blender. So we've probably got a transparent material, a solid material, and then you are using the ramp. A ramp set to horizontal. Oh, a flat projection on the render tag. So you did it uh, conceptually pretty different. It's a clean result, but what you did, I'm assuming, is this is now set to flat. And yeah, you did a flat projection from the side. Why does that turn black? Um, and you're just cropping things off that way. So a little less dynamic as far as being able to wrap the front part, but the material blend is working really well. The surprising part is what is different about, I, was, I gotta remember that material blending, but what is different about this that we can actually see inside of it? Why can we see inside of it where the other ones we couldn't? Because this is what I was expecting the entire time. Yeah, yeah, Zach. Um, but yeah, how, what is different about this one that we can see through it? Is it just because it's a fully different material? So it's seeing the front and the back. That's yeah, probably what it is. This glass material can just see through it. Um, the uh, This ramp, if we set this to... Uh, can we twirl it down? Well, we set the smooth. I'm going to say step. And now it should just be boom, harsh edge. And taking this material and scooting it forward and backward, as Zach said, will reveal more or less of the window. So it's just a harsh cut off. I would love, to, I gotta figure out how to do a proximal in Redshift. I'm gonna make a note to myself. Uh, how to make proximal in Redshift. There's gotta be even like a mathematical way of doing it because it's really just a radius from something. Check out the solution in the thread. Well, if it's in the chat above, that is very ethereal. There's a lot of chat to find as well. There's a, okay, in the Slack, there's a... In the Slack, there's one. Okay, that's good to know. Well, uh, I'll investigate this more. I want to know more about this as well. Understanding it as more time goes on that we can get better and better at these types of... Uh, things and these types of questions might as well set this up i mean this is my rig just with uh zach doing a nice transition a nice simple transition with his material so we should be able to just throw this out to the picture viewer and take a look at the frames um let's go really quick at 540 zoom might as well might as well why not right That's a Zach copy. Boom. So we won't see any windows until they blob a little bit bigger, but it should only take a couple frames for them to grow to that size. And then we see the windows. And then everything else is just dynamics. Playing around with refraction, to get nice lighting, and just letting those bounce around doing their thing. I mean, you can put a lot of turbulence in there. Those could be very light. They could be very heavy. If we make them very heavy, then they will be forcing their sphere to react to them. If they're very light, then they'd have like no impact on it. And they'd just be getting bounce around by the sphere that they're in. What's funny is that these can interconnect, but the cubes couldn't fall in between them. Um, I mean, we could make the cubes colliding with the blob 
and not the spheres, but I would not want to do that. That would be a lot of calculation. But yeah, uh, at this point, it would be making the blobs visually interesting to uh, bounce around to do their thing. Doing the right layer of refraction. Maybe some subsurface scattering on the walls. Get some glow coming directly from the cubes. Put it in a nice looking world. Uh, this is probably another gray light because I wasn't sharing the uh, HDR. So that would automatically look that make that look nicer. But let's just see how the motion looks generically. Bing. Yeah, see, immediately there's like, okay, there's something kind of interesting happening there. Bing, bing. So that's the simple version of just cropping it with a ramp. But yeah, I'll take a look in the Slack later and get some more details. But the stream is running over. Um, so we'll just say that that's a good one. I'll include this modified file from Zach just because it's a nice clean one. So thank you, Zach, for taking a look at that. And I, I saw a bunch of people in the Slack channel. I mean, this is the kind of thing I wouldn't mind doing a little more often. I don't know. It's more like, okay, once with the streams kind of wrapped up like I did here, where it's like, hey, everybody, like, that's done. Let's take a look at some of the files and see if they got anybody got them working. That's a cool way of interacting actively with the Slack. But I don't want to do it, like, in the middle of a stream because I think it just messes up the flow. I'm kind of... It's a little weird. You see how, like, when they first come into existence, we told the gradient to have no fall off, but there is still fall off. It would be fun to do a little bit of a transition here and have a, a bit of a glow or making it a little organic. But you could do that with a proximal and some noise if we get that working. Probably want to increase the uh, gravity and the steps, the calculation, double up the uh, time. But yeah, that should wrap this up. Um, let's go find my interface here. It almost turns itself invisible because it's projecting what's already on the screen. So there we go. Okay, thank you so much, everybody, for coming and checking it out. As mentioned, I've got the schedule now on the Rocket Lasso live stream page, rocketlasso.com slash live stream, to check out the links there. All of the scene files that we created today and for the other weeks and for bonus live streams on Tuesdays and Thursdays. You can join Patreon to support there. And if you just like the stuff I do, uh, keep an eye out for the vacuum forming tutorial, which will be out in a week. Otherwise, I'll see the Patreon people in tomorrow's bonus stream and i'll see everybody else next wednesday thank you so much everybody and i'll see you next time bye bye